People of Earth, this is the Great Goon Podcast, and I am the Great Goon, and I am here today with Neil Berliner, comedy writer extraordinaire, and fellow Brooklynite. Grew up in my neighborhood, never even met him in my neighborhood. And also, I hear he might be a doctor. Is that correct? Well, all Jewish kids are doctors, but I actually became one. I couldn't become a comedy writer until I became a doctor. Then my mom let me become a comedy writer after that. What is your doctor practice? What are you a doctor of? I'm a psychiatrist, actually. Oh, so you talk to crazy people. <laughs> yeah, that's just my colleagues. Yeah. <laughs> kind of prepares I you for the comedy. Most of them are crazy. <laughs> when, did you, when did you start uh, professionally writing comedy? I started, I think, way back when I was a kid. I wasn't the class clown. I always wanted to behave in class when I was a kid because I wanted to get into medical school. But uh, in the hallways and the playground, I would kid around and even roast people when I was very, very young before I even knew what roasting was. Yeah, I was a short kid and uh, people would pick on me. So I would use comedy to my advantage. How tall are you? I'm about 5'4". That's exactly how tall I am. We're the same size. Well, that's how you got here, maybe. I don't know, (laughs) Charles. I mean, you know what? We, I noticed something else about us. We both know how to sing. You're a damn good singer. Thank you. You sing. I, sing I didn't know you rock, sang. I sing in a rock band, in a cover band. Oh, all right. Yeah. We've got to get a duet going one day. Maybe. But you like the old stuff. You like Frank Sinatra. You like the classics. Yeah. I like classic rock, actually. Tom Petty, Bob Dylan, Neil Young. Well, you actually, you moved your camera, but you actually right above there have two guitars, don't you? I do. I have one autograph by Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers and another autograph by Les Paul. Oh, that's And he signed it for my son on my son's birthday. So uh, that's great. I'm very proud of those two guitars. I saw Les Paul at the Iridium. uh, That's exactly where I met him. Right next to Caroline's. Uh, Yes, that's right. 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 It's um, on Broadway and 50th. And I went and I saw him once. And I took a photograph with him, but it was like an old camera. It was a camera photograph. It's not like we didn't have the cell phones back then. And then about a year later, I went to see him again. And at the end of the show, everybody's lined up for, for uh, autographs, mostly to sign guitars or albums. I was the only one in line and said, can you sign the picture of me and you together? And he signed it. <laughs> well, that's exactly what he did for us after the second show only. And uh, I got a picture with a cell phone with a uh, uh, cell phone. So I'm very proud of that, too. Yeah, he was a great guy. And he died about a month or two after that. And he was in his so I was very lucky to get that autograph for my kid. He was like yeah. 90-something, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's a great, well, he's one of the, the, the innovators of uh, technology and stuff like that. And some of his biggest hits were with Bing Crosby, who's my favorite singer. <laughs> so there you go. Oh, yeah, I've heard you do him. That's right. Yeah. 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 So, but... You said you were always joking around and stuff like that, but when did you officially start to get like paid to write jokes and comedy for people and for, for whatever? Well, I started writing for other people after med school, actually, after my residency, when things got a little less pressured on me. And uh, I got a few lucky breaks and around, I wound up writing for a woman who got several appearances on the Howard Stern show, Rapping Granny. I remember her. I met her right Fruity before. Fruity Nutcake. Fruity Nutcake, Rapid yeah. Granny. Yeah. yeah, I met her in the village doing a show. And I just walked up to her and said, uh, I'd like to spice up your act a little bit, make it a little more rappy. She was doing, uh, you know, funny, cute things, but she wasn't too into the rap scene or uh, dirty lyrics and sexual kind of lyrics like I would use. And, and six months later, we were lucky to get a call from KC of the Howard Stern Show. And she did several appearances after that. And I met many people at the Stern Show, like Artie Lang. And one thing led to another. And I started writing for roasts. And then from the Stern Show, went to Comedy Central Roast, Friars Club, and uh, monologue jokes and things like that. So I've... You I've wrote for the, for the Howard Stern Roast? You got to be lucky. Right, Charles, you got to be lucky. You, roast, you wrote for the Howard Stern Roasts? Yes, I did. I wrote for... The Artie Lang roast for the Andy Dick roast for the Ronnie the Limo Driver roast. Uh, I think a few others can't remember. Oh, the Gary Delabate roast, the Baba Booey roast. I wrote a lot of lines for that as well. Yeah. Are you still in touch with any of the Stern people? 
they have nothing to do with me. And uh, let's go to one of the next topic, Charles. Wow. Uh -oh. no, that's, okay. Now that's what I want. No, no, I have about. friends. I have friends still from the Stern Show. I absolutely do. It's a different show now, you will admit. It's a different show. Howard is down here in Florida, and uh, he's uh, become friends with a lot of people he used to make fun of. And yeah. The show softened up a bit, but there's only one Howard Stern, one of the greatest comedians on the planet who does it four hours, you know, every morning. Well, not every morning, but several mornings a week. I mean, who can do that? Who can keep up that pace? like Howard after so many years and still be good at it. And he's probably the best interviewer on the planet, or at least one of them. In yeah, my his opinion. interview. You know, except for the great Goonan, of course. Yeah. Well, except for me, obviously, I like to say. Obviously. Otherwise, this interview would be over if you didn't say that. But um, he is one of the greatest interviews. But it became less of a, a satirical show. It became less of a, 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 a flat-out comedy show. That used yes, to he be. Does, does fewer impersonations like he used to do. Um, they do fewer bits. Yeah. Uh, it's gotten a bit lazy, maybe a bit lazy over the last couple of years. But all in all, it's the best thing. I mean, I'm down in Florida, and when you turn on morning radio in Florida or most other places in the country, and you hear the Howard Stern imitators, Howard obviously is still far and away better than you know any of them. Obviously, he's, right. he's, did you write for Friars Roast too? Yes, I wrote for two Friars Roasts, the Pat Cooper Roast, but the big one that I wrote for was the Matt Lauer Roast. And I I mean, I got to brag about something here, right? Can't brag about my looks. So I got to brag about what I did for the Friars Roast of Matt Lauer. Um, one of the roasties was uh, Katie Couric, mm. and she wanted one of the writers to write for her little known facts about Matt Lauer. So the little known fact about Matt Lauer I came up with was that he loves to eat curry. Oh. Now, Ann Curry was right. on the deck and 1,500 people, I swear, hit the deck. Mm. And it was written up, that line was written up by every, the Village Voice, the Post, every, every newspaper. And it was like my crowning glory of, of writing for roasts, that line for Katie Kirk. So. Now, that is so there's a, that. that's a big roast, but I really would love to talk about the Pat Cooper one because I'm a fan of Pat Cooper's. Uh, oh, I, you know what? Pat Cooper and I, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Pat Cooper and I have the same birthday, July 31st, actually. Yeah. Oh, I wrote for his roast. I'm very happy to write for that. He's retired they, now, right? I'm sorry. Yeah, he's retired. Well, it's funny you say he's retired because one of the lines I wrote for that roast was Pat always used to be on tour, but now the only tour he's on is Lipitor. There you go. <laughs> he's and, uh, a he's a combative individual in 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 all his oh, life. Oh, especially and on the Stern Show, he was very combative. Yes, with his own family. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely is right. He had some battles royale on the Stern Show with his with his kids and his ex wife and whoever else it was. Yeah, but personally, your interactions with him are are how you know nice interactions. I mean, I don't know him well, but. Uh, Spoke to him before the roast and sat next to him at the dinner uh, with uh, Bill. What's his name? Bill, the, the news guy, Bill. Um, Butel? Butel, Bill Butel. Yeah, Butel. it was a picture of me, Bill Butel and uh, Pat, uh, Pat Cooper, taken by my friend Bobby Bank, who's a, a photographer of a lot of celebrities and comedians. And uh, that's online, that picture. So I was happy to write to the Pat Cooper roast. I was a big fan of his. And I had met him, actually, I met him several years before at Westbury when I was very friendly with Jackie Mason. And Jackie invited me to died. the show. And well, Jackie and Pat were doing a show together at, at a lot of places. And uh, Jackie invited me to Westbury. And I went up to Pat and I said, I'm a big fan of yours. But I, I really think you're fantastic. And he looks at me, he goes, you've got terrible taste for being a fan of his, you know. <laughs> so that's how, that was the first time I met Pat Cooper. Jackie Mason just recently died, and and he was all this also, is true. All this is true. <laughs> he, he also uh, lived into his nineties and stuff, or ninety. And, yes, um, you would see him walking around the city too. You would see him, especially. Yeah, he was a people person. He would like he loved the attention. Jackie loved attention, and he was a great guy. And uh, I learned so much from him when I was in med school. 
we used to play his albums, his vinyl albums, and we memorized the lines and imitated him. It was a great relief of stress for us in med school. And later on, when he did his Broadway show, I said to him, you know, I have all your albums on vinyl. And he said, bring them in, bring them in. I forgot some of the lines. I forgot some of the stuff, you know. So I, I brought all his albums in on cassette for him, his vinyl albums on cassette. And he listened to everything. And he added, he actually added some stuff from his old albums that he had forgotten into the Broadway show, one of the Broadway shows he did. So, yeah, I, I was good friends with Jackie for a while, actually, too. I heard other comedians didn't get along with him, though. Depends on the person, you know. If a Jewish person met him, they would like him. If not, they wouldn't. You know. Did you ever meet Rodney Dangerfield? Oh, Rodney's my one of my best stories. You know, this is like it's scripted almost for me. I can't believe it. We didn't even speak before the interview. But when I was 14 years old, I decided I'm going to type up on my mother's typewriter on index cards some Rodney Dangerfield type jokes. So I typed up about, I don't know, 20, 30 jokes took the train into the city from Brooklyn, went to Dangerfields. And uh, I came back a week later and somebody handed me, I guess his manager handed me a note that said, dear Neil, I'm a very tough customer, but I write most of my own material. Best of luck, Rodney. And I kept the note. It's too bad. It's in my other, it's in my office down the hall. Um, I kept that note from Rodney for all these years. I have it for all these years. And I checked out his autograph online and it was definitely his handwriting. So he personally wrote that note. He knew it was a kid coming in. So he was very nice to me. But one line I wrote, I remember, I liked it. I thought it was good. I thought it was good enough for Rodney. Tell me what you think. It was uh, something like, um, I think it was, I asked my wife to pick me up on 48th Street and she brought a pooper scooper. Oh, so, yeah, that's you know, a for, 14, for a fourteen-year-old kid, you know, what can I say? Yeah, those guys were genuine characters, or uh, they're not many people like those guys anymore. They're genuine oh. characters in and of themselves. Like I, I even didn't realize that Jackie Mason and Pat Cooper did shows together because I would think they'd be too big to be together. Well, you know what they, they call build. themselves? They build themselves as the peculiar two. The Peculiar Two, and they even played Brooklyn College. And I was at the show, and Jackie's mic went out. They were on stage at the same time, sort of like a roast battle, like they do now, like the roast battles. Oh, wow. And it was Jackie and Pat on stage the whole time together. And they were going back and forth, but Jackie was, his mic wasn't working, and he's cursing and screaming at the sound guy. And it, it was like a whole calamity, but it was. I remember that show very well because it was a total failure, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so was your was your first entree into writing for big show business guys the Stern Show or was it before that? Yeah, the Stern Show opened up things for me. You know, I got to meet Artie Lang and Artie did me, you know, was very nice to me. And uh, he was on the William Shatner roast and I got to write lines for the Shatner roast. And then I went on to write another one for Comedy Central, uh, the Flavor Flav roast. Oh, yeah. Okay. I can't really say who I wrote for for the Flavor Flavor Roast because it's kind of a secret. But so, you know, some some comedians are OK with with people knowing that they have writers. Sometimes some comedians aren't so OK with it. But uh, Artie and I were good friends and uh, he helped me a lot. And I really appreciate everything he's done for me. And do you have any news about where he is? You said it disappeared. Uh, the rumor is that he's writing a book right now. That's the last I've heard. And that he's clean and doing well. And I just wish all the best for Artie. Just that's all I can say about that. Did you, ever, did you ever become friendly with the other guys like Sal and Richard? And yeah, guys? Sal and Richard. Oh, my God. Well, the nicest guy in the Stern show is Richard. He's the uh, nicest guy. Sal's a prankster. He's a real prankster. Yeah. And he... Uh, he always made fun of my hair because, uh, of course, you can't tell, but this is not my real hair. I kind of, you would not know anything like that, but, you know, because you have, you have good hair, so you don't look at other people's hair. But No, I wouldn't dare. Believe it or not, this is a hairpiece. And backstage at one of the Stern, show, one of the, uh, Stern events, we had Artie and Bob Levy. Everybody was there, actually, except for Howard Stern. Um, uh that Gary was there. It was the night that Sal broke his wrist on stage. And you mean when he, he fell in, off stage? He fell off stage because right. yeah. Gary came on 
I with remember. A, uh, no, no, Sal came on with a Gary mask and chased him across, chased Gary across the stage, but Sal didn't realize he was running off the stage. And so the he, stage fell was high into, up. he fell off this, he was from high up, okay. fell off the stage. As I said, I'm a doctor. I ran right over to him and I said, he's got a broken wrist. And I had to spend the whole night in a Tampa ER with uh, Sal with his broken wrist and Tom Chiasano, the general manager of the Stern Show or the producer of the Stern Show, whatever he was back then. And But anyway, that night before the show, Sal and Richard were getting drunk and giving me some beers. And Sal, whenever he would see me, he would lift my hair up a little bit, like an inch, like to check my hair, the hairline and everything. Yeah. And that night they got so drunk and I got drunk and they just ripped my hair off my head. And I saw like a million flash bulbs go off at once. I felt like I was like at the Oscars or something. It was like all, it was a very big backstage area. They let a lot of fans back there. And there must've been a hundred people taking pictures of me without any hair on. So it was, it was kind of creepy for me, but uh, it was a fun, it was like a wild night. And then the next, that was on over the weekend. And then that Monday morning, they played it on the Stern show. They, they played the whole thing of, uh, Sal and Richard, you know, playing around with my hair. It was like a whole whole big scene. It was very funny. And you but, met Howard then, right? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. And, and, and what are your experiences with Howard? Howard's a very nice guy. If you know him, if you're up there and, you've, you know, if you're among the people there, I mean, I, I mean, he also treats the fans very well. Though. From what I've seen, when I've been more involved with the show, sort of like as a fan, hanging out with maybe like Marianne from Brooklyn or High Pitch Eric or those guys. When I'm more in that kind of event, when I was more in that kind of a venue, he would always come over to the fans. Like when he would do Letterman, he would always get out of the limo, come across the street, say hello to everybody, sign autographs, take pictures. So he's very good to his fans. He, he really is. Yeah. Yeah. So then let's say let's let's try to do the chronology here from stern you meet Artie, and from Artie you get comedy central right and then where do you go what's the next step after that next step was i started writing for just different comedians people uh someone who did me a very big solid was eddie brill eddie brill is as you know he was the warm-up comedian for the letterman show for 17 years and uh I got him a gig with Artie in Florida. It was him and uh, him and Artie down here in South Florida in West Palm Beach area. And uh, when he signed the contract, I had to meet him at the Letterman show. And he was very nice at, at, at that gig. He let me actually sit at David Letterman's desk after the show. And he let my wife sit there with me. And we took pictures. And, he, and he's a doll. He's a great guy. Very nice guy. And just based on Facebook jokes that I had written over the past previous few years, Eddie recommended me for writing jobs to comedians. And uh, so I, I got jobs like that. And one time I was in Paris with my wife and kids and I get a phone call in Paris and I didn't expect my phone to ring. And are you a sports fan, Charles? I'll probably know the reference. Go ahead. Okay, here's the reference. I get a call from Christopher Russo, wow. the Mad Dog. He was, he, he was, he was on the show, Mike He's and the Mad Dog, guy. a very famous sportscaster yeah. guy. And he says, Neil, he says, I'm calling you. It's Chris Russo from Sirius Radio. And the guy from Letterman said, um, you could write for me because I'm doing a roast. I'm doing a roast of a referee in the NBA. He's retiring. And so I said, hey, this is wild. I said, everybody calls you, Chris Russo. They call you on your show. And here you are. I'm in Paris and you're calling me. This is so cool. I can't believe it. So I decided that I would, I said, listen, I'll do the, I'll write the whole roast, your whole roast thing. He was the roast master for that thing. So I wrote him a whole, a whole roast about the NBA referee. And I did it in my hotel room in Paris, like in an hour after that. And I was so happy to be right working with Chris Russo. I would have charged somebody else, but I didn't even charge him a penny. I just did it for free. I was so thrilled to be writing for Christopher Russo, one of my sports heroes. So, uh, and you, and then you know, I just, and then I, then I got into teaching. I did, I got into because uh, I write mostly monologue jokes, monologue and uh, roast jokes. So I got a job at a at a show in L.A. called the John Kerwin Show, which is modeled after the Tonight Show. And I wrote monologue jokes for John for a couple of years. And then I got into teaching uh, one-liner writing. And I, I'm sure you're familiar with The Pit, the People's Improv Theater yes. in New York. 
and uh, I became the joke instructor at the pit for a few years. Oh. So I've, I've had a great time with all this. I've been very, very lucky, got a few breaks, made so many friends in comedy, and uh, I even crashed one of your events. You want to talk I about know. that? I know. I know you did. I was, <laughs> I was surprised. I, I mean, I didn't crash it. Shit, I didn't crash it. No, but people were Charles, invited. I'll tell the people. Charles was doing a, a pilot for something. I forget what it was for, but he was doing a pilot on our Facebook. He said, I'm doing a pilot party. Can everybody come down? You know? So I was in the city that night, had nothing to do. You see, I was living in Florida and practicing medicine in New York. I was flying up to New York every week. So for two or three nights a week, I didn't see my wife and kids. I would fly up to New York. So I, most, most nights I would either go to a comedy club or just do nothing. And that night I had nothing to do. So I said, uh, I guess going to Charles's party is better than nothing to do. So oh, I went to your party. What a I'm, I'm kidding. endorsement. I'm kidding. Yeah. I know, but I yeah, you nice. showed up. I had yeah. never met Charles before. So I said, hey, I'll go to the party. Right. So I went to the Charles's party and he showed the, he showed the clip. He showed the entire uh, pilot. And then I went up to Charles and said, hey, I'd like to take, you know, take, take a picture. There's a couple of people, a few people were taking a picture up there. So I got up there. And then the next day I learned that I was crashing the cast photo of Charles's pilot. It was every, only people in the show were in that picture. And this schmuck, Neil Berliner, was, was also in the picture. So I wound up crashing the part. I'm sorry. No, it was good. No, no, no. It was good. It was good. Yeah, that's a show. That's a show called Tune in, Tune into Goonin. It's a web series. I'm shooting more of it now uh, while I'm in uh, New York right now. I'm shooting more uh, another episode. So that will uh -huh. come out in about two weeks. And we actually shot a scene. You will be in it too. Oh, really? Oh. What do you mean, oh, really? You remember? It just happened. We just shot the scene. Oh, that. Oh, mean, oh you mean this tonight? Oh. Yes. I forgot it, to take my Aricept. That's an that, Alzheimer's drug, Charles. What we did, the, the, the scene we did tonight is an additional episode of the thing that you came to. Oh, I see. Yeah. So it's okay, great. a continuation great. of that. Right. On your uh, social media page, you have, uh, uh, as your, I think it's your main picture, this picture you took with Jerry Seinfeld and Jay Leno. Oh, yeah. How did that come about? The guys wouldn't leave me alone until I took the picture. Where I mean, were I you? Of, it was at the Gotham, I'm sorry? Yeah, where were you? Oh, it was at the Gotham Comedy Club. And I was trying to leave, and Leno and Seinfeld just, would not leave without the picture. So I insisted, they insisted, and I took the picture, smiled, I was nice about it. And they knew who you were? No, actually, Charles. I begged, uh, here's what happened. <laughs> I knew Jay from various events previously, and uh, the John Kerwin show that I told you about earlier uh, was written by a guy as well as myself named Marvin Silbermintz, who was a Jay Leno writer for many years. And through Marv, I became friendly with Jay. I met him at a few events. Um, and then that night at Gotham, I said, Jay, uh, remember me? I'm Neil from, uh, uh, Mar I'm Marv's friend from the John Kerwin show. He said, oh yeah, I remember you. He said, I said, would you mind taking a picture with me outside when you're, when you're done in here? And because Seinfeld and Leno had come in to do, it was like an open mic night or something. I was looking at another client's material and they just popped in. So I went over to Jay and he um, was nice enough to take a picture with me outside and Jerry was standing there. I said, Jerry, would you come in? And he was very nice about it and got into the picture. And it's my, my very uh, proud picture to be with Jerry and Jay in one shot. It was great. Is there great. somebody that you wish you could have written for? I mean, who's not around anymore? Like, even if, it, if it's uh, a historically famous comedian from another generation, is there anyone you go, boy, I would have loved to have written for that person? It's real funny you mention that because just tonight I was, I'm cleaning out my office. And this is true. Um, I have a bunch of junk on my, like to the side of my desk. I have to clear it out because uh, tonight I got, you know, from the home run derby, Pete Alonso of the Mets won the home run derby. And a friend of mine painted his bat and his name is Gregory Siff. And he painted the home run bat that Pete Alonso won with. Well, Gregory uh, offered for sale 40 of those bats in a limited edition. And today mine arrived. So it's a special blue and orange Pete Alonso bat. And I had to make room for it in my office. So I had to clear out some other crap. And one of the things I had to clear out is an album, a comedy album. And the comedy album is by one of my childhood heroes. And his name is London Lee. 
His oh, London Lee. Yeah. London Lee, Lee, the rich kid. He was on Ed Sullivan when we were kids. And I used to think he was the greatest comedian in the world. Well, I got to met I got to meet London later in life. And he signed an album for me and everything. And that was the album I just I moved around somewhere else. And he was the, he's the guy, to answer your question, who I would have liked to have written for, London Lee. He was terrific. Wow. Yeah. Now, you have in your arsenal, on command at any time, a series of jokes that would fit monologues and whatnot, don't you? Yeah, well, you know, most monologue jokes are throwaways. They're, they're topical, they're current events kind of stuff. So, well, actually, in my course, I used to say there are about five kind of monologue jokes. There's the political, what was it, the sports, the uh, celebrity, the science and technology jokes, and the throwaways, the one-offs, the weird stories. So, so that, in a way... That, in a, way, in a way, a monologue is like a newspaper articles and sure, sure, sure. It, it covers that's what a newspaper would cover. That's very true. Yeah. yeah. So it covers. I would say ninety nine percent of the jokes you hear on the late night monologues are in one of those five categories. Yeah. So I'm always writing monologue jokes and stuff. And uh, I guess you want to go through some of them. Well, so you have them? Yes. Let's let's hear some of them. I have Here a bunch of jokes. Yeah. Why? Let's let's do them. You know, they're not related to each other. Like you, when you do your set at a club, you have segues. One thing leads into another. You have pairs of jokes, you know, tags and triplets and stuff. These are just unrelated jokes. So here we go. Joke number one. All right. A couple I know named their child Brooklyn because they met in Brooklyn. Another couple I know named their child Whorehouse. Do you have a laugh track, Charles? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's his brother. Right? That's, okay, here's, an, here's another joke. Uh, I care so much about you that I'd even donate a kidney to you if you needed one. Just not one of my own. Right. <laughs> not mine. <laughs> it, it, not mine. <laughs> Suicide Squad is now in theaters across America. I'm talking about the unvaccinated audience. Ooh, that's a, that's a real new one. That digs deep, Charles. That digs deep. Digs deep. That digs deep. Instead of fries, McDonald's now offers a side salad, fruit, or veggies. They're also going to give pamphlets describing to their customers what those things are. Right, because they never had those before. Yeah, this is true. Explain the joke, Charles. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You know, my parents wanted me to be homeschooled, just not in their house. Right. I could see that. I could see that. Yeah. Hey, why, hey, Charles, why don't car thieves just dress up as valet guys in front of expensive restaurants? That's a good point, actually. That's a very You're, good point. You'd never see your Porsche again, right? Yeah. But, I mean, they'd get away with it so much easier. They could get away with it for the night. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. I told you I was in a rock band, right? I told you I was in a cover band. Mm -hmm. Well, the band I'm in gets requests from the audience for the same song every time we play live. You might know this song. It's called Get Off the Stage, You Assholes. Oh, I love that song. They play that. Kicked in, song. huh? I they love that. on you. <laughs> okay. Here's another musical one. Steven Tyler is dating his 28-year-old personal assistant. The only Aerosmith song she knows is Dude Looks Like He's 80. Oh. As opposed to Dude Looks Like right. a Lady. Yes. Oh, you'll explain it. Okay. I'll yes. explain it. I, want I know. Nice. No, I, I understand. I know I mean. you're not big on the rock, Charles. You're not big on the rock stars. Okay. All right. I'm such a bad comedian though, that Carlos Mencia sends me jokes. Oh. What do you think about that? What do you think about I that? I don't know. I mean, that's the reputation he has. I don't know. Is that Who knows if it's true? I don't know. Well, let's, assuming it's true, don't you think he's then a bastard? That he's been what? If Assuming that it's true, isn't he a bastard? I guess so. I mean, Robin Williams used to unconsciously yeah. steal jokes from people, but he'd walk around with $100 bills, and if a comedian would say, hey, you stole my joke, he would just hand him $100. Yeah. He would hand he or she a $100 bill. So he, he, had, he sort of, I mean, you know, there's parallel thinking in comedy, and some people just right. simulate material from other, hearing a lot of material and uh they they assimilate it to themselves and, and use it so but robin williams he would just literally pay people if they told yeah. him that so that was nice that was very nice yeah. did you ever meet joan rivers no i, I have not met joan rivers my oh, friend larry amaros 
was very close with Joan Rivers. I believe he wrote for her a lot. But I did see a contract that Joan Rivers had. It was like uh, a, a joke contract with, with, for writers. Like it was typed out. It said, you're being given $10 for the joke on blank topic and, you know, to be used by Joan Rivers. And it was like wow. sort of a contract. Yeah, yeah she, she, had, she, she had writers uh, do uh, one-liners for her. I think yeah. it was pretty well known. And she was okay with that. You know, people were all right with that. Uh, here's another one. Okay, go ahead. Chinese scientists say Chinese scientists say they are close to developing an invisibility cloak. Until now, the only way to be completely invisible was to be in a sketch during the last ten minutes of Saturday Night Live. Oh, it's true too. It's true. Isn't it true? It is true. Yeah. Truth. The truth, Charles. It's what's funny. Did you ever did you ever meet any of the SNL people? I did. And I'll tell you who I met in the first year of SNL. And these two people came to Brooklyn College. They were doing a publicity tour. And they were um, Alan Joy Bell, who's more of a writer than a performer. Right. And um, oh my God, I'm drawing a blank on her name. I can't believe it. Rosanna Rosanna Dana. Gilda Red. Rosanna Rosanna Dana. Um, Gilda oh my Radner. God, this is embarrassing. Huh? Gilda, Gilda Radner. Gilda. Okay, so they came to Brooklyn College. Yeah. And years later, after I did my two Friars roasts, yeah. somebody at the Friars Club said, why don't you join the Friars? I said, okay, I, you know, why not? I'll join the Friars. I didn't know any better. So uh, I walk into the Friars Club, and who's interviewing me? Alan Joy Bell. So Alan Joy Bell interviews me. And the, on the way out of the interview, he says, when you get in, I'll teach you the, the secret handshake. The secret handshake, right? And a month later, I got a rejection from the Friars Club. Oh. True story. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I've been rejected by the Friars. So now, among these among these jokes that you have there with you right now, right. are they separated into category? Could I call out a topic and you could pull it out? Probably not. There's only about fifteen written here. But call out a category. Maybe I'll luck out. Okay. Uh, let's say sports. Uh, I didn't look out, but can I think of a sports joke? Here's a sports joke that's really, this is one of my most hated jokes. Oh. And every year I repeat it. I call it my, my hated spring training joke. Every year during baseball spring training, I put this joke up and here's how the joke goes. Here's my hated spring training joke. Come on, you can do it, Slinky. Get down those stairs, Slinky. You can do it. Spring oh. training. <laughs> All right then. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, look, I can't. I kind of came up with a sports joke, Charles. Right? That's kind of a sports joke. That's all right. Give me another category. Maybe I'll, I won't look out again twice, but I'll try. Politics. Oh, that's easy. Yeah. You know, that's just Trump jokes. You know, I'm. I'm you know, I hate Donald Trump. But God, for comedy, Charles, was he the best or what? I mean, well, I think that it's time to, to, to talk about something else, though. Like there's shows that are still doing that, you know, and they're still like I'm not I'm not a huge fan of like exclusive political jokes. But a lot of the late night shows have become mostly just all politics. It's too and, much. It's too much. And, yeah. and the comedians are very interested in letting you know they're crusaders for righteousness and they and that they're smart. And that never oh, used think? to always be. I'm sorry. And that didn't always used to be the way a late night show was. You didn't know. No, and Carson which brings me to my next point. Johnny Carson. I said Carson that. was right. You never knew. I mean, he was. You never knew who we voted for. You never knew anything political about Johnny Carson, and he was the best of, of all of them. He and was my role model, and I'm sure one of yours, right? Well, absolutely, because you could still watch his stuff because of that. Like absolutely, they, you know, it's not dated because of that. Another thing is, although I'm not, I'm a bigger fan of the Johnny Carson Tonight Show than Jay Leno, but Jay Leno too. I don't think he knew who he voted for either. Exactly. Exactly. You know? But now everybody wants to tell you what side they're on, and you need to join. <laughs> right. You're you're either like a Trevor Noah or a uh, a Colbert. Or DePaulo on the other side. You well, DePaulo, yeah, DePaulo's doing like a podcast now, and he's probably one of the only like really funny guys who do a conservative bent because for some reason the conservative people 
they're just not, they don't have better shows. They have better radio shows. They don't have better TV shows. You know what I mean? The conservatives, wow. the conservatives have the radio shows all over the world, like all that stuff. But the, the late night TV shows are always liberal. But DePaulo is doing a, a podcast now. And uh, I haven't watched it in a little while, but when I would, I would laugh because just the way he phrases things and, and, and his sort of like street language is very funny to me. I, I find him very funny. Well, I remember one time at Caroline's, he came on, I was there and, uh, and he just yelled at the crowd, go, oh, you all, you Obama people. I know you're all Obama people. And, uh, but he still won the crowd over anyway, because he's so talented. You know? Yeah, he's just, he's just too funny to ignore. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, you never knew who Johnny Carson was writing for, was voting for, and you never knew, and that, and that way he's a universal figure, as opposed exactly. to as opposed to being somebody who, because there are people, a lot of the shows now, especially late night shows, are more about people applauding because they agree with the, the point of view than laughing at whether or not it was clever. Well, I think people who are into comedy and are younger might bend more liberally, probably bend much more liberally in general than conservatively. So Maybe, there's, but that, yeah, uh, but I think in general that's probably true. But I, I think we would both agree that whatever your politics are really has nothing to do with whether or not you're funny. Right, so, funny is funny, no right. matter how you look at it. Right, right. You know, I just don't find Biden as funny a person as we could make Trump into, though. Well, Trump was already a cartoon; like he was already this Absolutely. thing. You know, the, this this he was already like satirized naturally if if you know what i mean he already, way before he was president yeah. yeah yeah he already seemed like something from a comic book or something like that uh so it's it's a little different biden i mean it's anybody can make fun of the president i don't care i'm not i'm not uh, political at all really but so i'm not like mad about somebody making a joke on the right or the left i'm just Wait, saying you don't like sports you don't like politics <laughs> do you like charles what are you into I mean, well, politics, uh, politics in, in, in the age of Trump sort of became the only thing anyone ever wanted to talk about. So, you know, well, it was unavoidable, I guess. Well, but now they should stop. I think they're still kind of still doing it. I think yeah, I think you're right. I think you have right. to start thinking of new things. Yeah, I think yeah. we've got more. We've got to move on. We've got to move on. Yeah. What was your favorite joke growing up? Not of your own, but a joke. Oh my God, jeez! I think you got me on that. Well, I'll uh, tell you one. Oh, I, rem I remember one—a Woody Allen joke hmm. from one of his movies. Uh, they in one of his movies, uh, maybe it was Sleeper. They said they're going to take his brain out or something, and he said, "My brain—that's my second favorite organ." Right, right, right. I love Woody <laughs> Allen. Woody well, Allen I guess from, just came into my head. He's from my neighborhood, and I. Oh yeah, I got a lot of people get mad at me because I don't believe he did anything. Now wait, he went to Midwood, right? Was it Midwood or Madison High School? No, he went to Midwood. I went to Midwood. Madison, but it's you went still, to Madison. It's still the same area. Okay, yeah. okay. Because just last night I did a charity show for Sheep's Head Bay High School. Oh yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Because you know who went there? Larry David, Elaine Boozler, Fred Stoller, Michelle Ballin, uh, Joey Novick, Linda Siegel, Lakin. Um, who else? Who else? Uh, I'm missing somebody, but oh. I'm missing some people, but a lot of comedians came out of Sheepshead Bay High School. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Madison, the one I went to, that that's Chris Rock, Dice Clay, uh, and then Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Charles Schumer. <laughs> so, <laughs> so whatever. And me. I once asked Amy Schumer if she was related. She is. Charles, and she shot back at me. No. She is I'm related like, to him. I've had very, I haven't had the best experiences with Amy. But she. Even before, even before she was famous. Really? Yeah, I don't know. She, I don't know. I think maybe she thought I was hitting on her or something, which I wasn't, but whatever. But she, she is related to Charles Schumer. I know that. And she denied it to me. Hmm. Maybe she just didn't want to talk to me. That could be. Yeah. Common experience for women, but, you know, that's how it is. <laughs> but I have a gorgeous wife. You see my wife? Oh, my God. Yes. 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 yes I'm very I'm talented I'm and beautiful woman. I'm married. I'm very lucky. Your wife isn't isn't she in showbiz? I'm sorry, is she in yeah. showbiz? Yeah. No, no. My wife was the uh, she worked for HPE Hewlett Packard, and she was the 2021 
most valuable MVP, most valuable player in the storage division of HPE. So she's brilliant as well. And I have two very brilliant, handsome kids too. I'm very, my kids got all their mother's genes is what it comes down to. I mean, my kids, I, I tell people I'm a medical doctor and I am literally the stupidest person in my family. And it's true. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you if you're working on something now, what are you working on now? We're actually working on making the Sheep's Head show into a theater show because what we do is we have some stand-up comedy and my segment is different. My segment is punching up jokes on stage. I did a show in New York a couple of years ago called Fly on the Wall, which was the audience were all flies on the wall of a writer's room. So it would be me and a few other comedians. We would write jokes, do them on stage and punch them up in front of the audience and prove the jokes on stage. And they would get to see the process that goes on in a writer's room. Can you recall, so, can you recall, for instance, one of the jokes you did, even if it was recently with the Sheep's Head show that you punched up on the fly? Well, to tell you the truth, I tried to do that last night, but I wrote some decent jokes and people were having problems punching them up. So what you have to do is I have to take a joke that's good and mess it up a little bit. Right. Make words, it. You have to add stuff to it. Most of the th mistakes that people make is they make the jokes too long. Yes. And they, or they bury the punchline into the middle or what I call the punch word. They'll yes. put the punch word in the middle and keep talking. And then the crowd loses sense of, you know, what, what's funny here? Is it the middle of the joke? Is it the end of the joke? Right. So I think what you have to do to, for this kind of show, if you want to do it right, you either take people who don't write good jokes to begin with, or you take a good joke and mess it up a bit. You add stuff to it that's superfluous to the to the funny part, and maybe right. bury the punch word in the middle. Right. And you could you could ruin a great thing by putting too much fat on it and too much exactly too, too exactly much words and stuff. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Right. Well, because we're talking about like we're talking about those fellas like a Jackie Mason or a, or a Rodney. Um, there are some like new comedians that don't like that type of rat a tat tat one liner type of stuff like Rodney. But that's some of the hardest stuff to write well, because exactly it, you have to, yeah, you have to get it down to the to the bone. You have you to, have, to, have to be no unnecessary words mm -hmm. in the joke. A Rodney joke is a sentence, and it and it has to be the perfect sentence, and that's why when he does it like a when he did a set on the Tonight Show, it would be like a five seven minute set, but he's telling thirty of those jokes, and I always tell people. The toughest thing to write is just standalone one-liners, like really well. It was very tough to do. Right. And Rodney once said, every joke has to kill. There can't be a dog in the middle. You can't just put fluff jokes in the middle. Every joke has to stand on its own as a great joke. And for him, it worked. I mean, it was true. He would just do, he would crack Carson up like crazy. Yeah. yeah, that was always great to see, especially when he sat down later. That was when you wanted. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. But that's the toughest stuff to write because I've done I've done these these shows at uh, Governor's Radio where they had like these. It was like a, a competition for these comedians, and I would be the judge on a few of these episodes. And that's what I would tell them. I would tell them, you know, you're doing like because some people are story comics, some people are character comics, some people do all different types of acts. So there was this one lady who was doing mostly one-liners and they were all really weak and i was like look if you're gonna go do just one-liners i said they've got to be the best one-liners you know you you could tell a story and take time in like a bill cosby type of way not in the that way but in the bill Co you know and that's a different way but if you're doing just one-liners they have to they have to be perfect well you know i remember like when i used to do my class at the pit I would ask people at the end if they wanted me to punch up jokes and they would do a joke. And I would say, well, what's funny? Uh, what is the funny part of this joke? And sometimes they literally could not even answer that question. What, what the funny part of the joke was, let alone, you know, where to put it. So right. you have to really know what you're doing with these things. It's, it's like a science. It has to be exact. It's mathematical. You know, now, do you think I know what my opinion is? Uh, but do you think that the ubiquity 
of particularly stand-up comedy and how many people are doing it now compared to how they used to is the reason why there's less uh, like, I, I think that that makes less good ones the more you have. I think that the cream will always rise to the top, but that, yeah. like, uh, most of them are doing it because it's like a thing people do now, as opposed to it being their call to life type of thing. You know what I mean? Like, there's a right. lot of people who I met who are younger comedians, and, like, you know, th their credentials are, uh, I took the, the, the comedy club class at the comedy club. I'm like, how many times are you getting on stage? Like, are you going out? Are you doing things? Because I, I always, like, my advice to people when they ask me advice is, first of all, you shouldn't be asking me for advice because you should, you should comedians are very self-possessed. They should know what they're doing. Secondly, um, the best way to be good at it is you got to do it all the time. That's, that's the only way I could say to, to, to be good at it is you, you're not going to get good at it unless you do it all the time. Right. Um, and yeah, absolutely. And, uh, I'm actually an anomaly because I fell into it after I did. I had a choice to make. Do I become a doctor do I, or do I go into comedy? And, uh, you know, when you're a Jewish kid growing up in Brooklyn in the 60s and 70s, um, you become either a doctor or a lawyer. You don't become, you don't go out to Hollywood and tell your parents you're going to become a comedian. You got to be very brave to do that. And maybe I wasn't brave enough, but you know, I wanted to be a doctor too, though. I, I got to say, I did want to become a doctor. I've, I'm very lucky that I fell into comedy later on in life and, you know, have, have been lucky with it, but, uh, you really have to want it. You really have to want it badly. And frankly, you do have to have some kind of base level of talent. Not right. everybody is talented. Not everybody can do it. Just because you want to do it and you devote your life to it means you're going to be any good at it. Right. Like anything else. And like I couldn't be a surgeon. I became a psychiatrist. I didn't have the hands to be a surgeon. and I knew right. it. So I went into psychiatry. But people, I think some people don't just don't know when to quit. They keep taking more classes and more classes and more classes. And they do open mics and more open mics. And they can't write a joke. And right. uh, it's problematic right. in this field if you can't write a joke. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of that. Because the thing is, like, you know... Uh, like you were saying, you have to have uh, some form of uh, talent in you. It's just like when we were talking about singing earlier, there are people who could go take a million singing lessons and never be able to sing well, you know, no matter what. And so it's, uh, look, so it has yeah, to be absolutely. something that you have already. It's got to be something there to begin right. with. It's got to be something to start with, some right. core to mold into something. But there is well, a look, ubiquity now. Comedians are philosophers. They're, we're, we're the like we're modern day philosophers. We look at things differently than other people. And there's got to be some core level of intelligence too. Like you use the word ubiquity. 85% to 95% of the kids in the, in the clubs doing open mics, if you said the word ubiquitous to those kids, would they know what you're talking about? No, no, no. No, I just so, learned from you what it, the word meant, but <laughs> about other people. <laughs> no, it's just that, but 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 I mean, with with the the ubiquity of particularly stand up, I think there's a lot of people who who uh, who are not good, and I just I, I like a lot of people. I can I can usually tell after meeting them to tell you the truth. Like I go, this person's not real. They're doing it for a novelty, and there's nothing wrong with doing it for a novelty. But you don't belong in the same room with me. <laughs> you well, I think I you mean? have to, you know, well, people have to find their voice. You're either going to be a character. You have to decide, you can, am I going to be a character or I'm going to be myself? Right. And then you have to know about yourself to be able to present that self in an honest, funny way. Or else go behind, like, or else become like a Pee Wee Herman or a, look, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat, right? There's more than one way to skin a cat. So you can become a carrot top. You can become a Gallagher. But each of them knew exactly what they were doing. They didn't just fall into becoming those characters. They, they had a plan. And by the way, since you mentioned those two fellas, because I've spoken about, I'm a big fan of Gallagher. I like Gallagher. Um, and a lot of times, because he also used props, they, people dismiss him. And some comedians dismiss him. Oh, he's a prop guy. I said, his stuff's really smart stuff. He did prop stuff too, but he did stuff where he played with language and, you know, and stuff like that. And I never think, that there is, if you're funny, then that's good enough, as far as I'm concerned. Like, I know I don't think that this guy's a, a good comedian because he does, for instance, personal jokes, as opposed to a dude who does props. I think right. they're both as good if they're both making them laugh. 
Right. Look, if all Gallagher had was a watermelon, you wouldn't know the name Gallagher. Exactly. Period. I mean, right? Exactly. Like people sometimes, well, because a guy like that is sort of um, remembered more than known. So there's not like new stuff for the young people to grasp to. And people tend to um, see, I'm a big fan of show business too. A lot of comics aren't like there are things I just would never do as a performer. I would never bring notes on stage. I would never do like, I would just I pretend like I look like I know what I'm doing. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know? So there is that other side where they, they look down on maybe a guy like Gallagher, who's, who's, a, who's, Part of his comedy is spectacle, but but his stuff is very smart, though, I think. Right. And, you know, you mentioned jokes. I, I would tell people in the classes, I would rather have you get up there and do one good joke and get the hell off the stage without a note than do, you know, sit, stand there with your with your notebook. Oh, be a, you know, <laughs> read, read your notebook. It's ridiculous. Right. Well, that's a thing that that happens now with a lot of younger people, too, because they sort of want to show you how smart they are and how many notes they have. But that's the antithesis to me of performing. Like, I'm not showing you my set, my, my you know, uh, the, the bag of tricks. I'm just doing the tricks. You're doing the tricks. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. So do you have any more of those jokes there? We need to hear. I'll do a couple more. Then we'll call it a night. Oh, Come I'm on, ready. I got to get to the bathroom. All right. OK. Uh Here's an offensive joke about an illness. The only thing that completely cures my dyslexia is eating cheese and mac. Nice. You nice. got it, right? Yes, I did. Okay. How about this? Doctors have performed the first penis transplant in the United States. They would have done a penis and testicles transplant, but they just didn't have the balls to do it. Right. I agree. Okay. <laughs> All right, just a couple more, and then we're out of here, Charles. All right, let's let's. All right, okay. Them. I would do nothing because a Klondike bar has never done a goddamn thing for me. I like that a lot. I've okay. always said that to people about the right, Klondike right. bar. I like that one a lot. <laughs> that should be. Uh, uh, you should put that out uh, uh, as a post. I bet you a lot of people will like that one. I like. <laughs> that one. All right, I'm sorry to tell you this, but we needed to fire our cleaning lady today. Tell you why. Uh, we caught her stealing all the towels and little soaps that we steal from hotels. Yeah, that's for us. What is she trying to exactly. do? <laughs> Finally, let's end with this. All dad wants for Father's Day, Charles, is you. Out of his basement. Oh, that was too, too true. Too true. <laughs> oh, that was too true. So uh, tell us where we can uh, check out your stuff and uh, what we can look forward to in the very near future from you. Well, you know, like I said, monologue jokes are throwaways. So I put a lot of stuff out on Facebook. Just friend me on Facebook, Neil Berliner, B-E-R-L-I-N-E-R. -E and uh, if you want some help with your uh, comedy, you know, get a hold of me and I'm out there. I'm reachable. And, uh, and if we'll you need a psychiatrist, day. he's also a psychiatrist. Well, I only do that Mondays and Wednesdays from nine to one. I'm cutting back. I'm cutting back. Does it ever overlap? Does anybody in the psychiatry office go, are you a comic? Uh, patients have Googled me. Uh, prospective employers have Googled me and asked me at interviews more about comedy than about people. Look, if you say you're a doctor and a comedian, Trust me, nobody cares that you're a doctor. All they right. want to know about is the comedy, right? right? Like any, any comedian who has a regular, you know, some kind of other job during the day, nobody wants to know about that. So, yeah, people are much more interested in comedy than, uh, than medicine. Yeah. Well, there we have it, ladies and gentlemen. People are more interested in comedy than medicine. This has been The Great Goonin Podcast. I am The Great Goonin. I've been talking to Neil Berliner. I will see you next time, folks. Peace. Sick in the head. <laughs>